My guest this week is Jeff Bierzig. Jeff is an award-winning director, writer, and producer whose feature film, The Devil and Daniel Johnston, won top documentary directing honors at the 2005 Sundance Film Festival and was voted the number one best music documentary of the 21st century by IndieWire. His other directing credits include author, The J.T. Leroy Story, and The Real Rocky for ESPN's acclaimed 30 for 30 series, as a screenwriter, his work includes Chuck, a.k.a. The Bleeder, co-written with Jerry Stahl and starring Lee Schreiber and Naomi Watts, as well as the Johnny Paycheck pilot episode and two George Jones and Tammy Wynette episodes of Mike Judge Presents, Tales from the Tour Bus, an animated nonfiction music series for HBO. He's currently in production on the legendary Stardust Cowboy, an animated nonfiction feature-length Fantasia with Henry S. Rosenthal and Ted Hope producing. And it is my great pleasure to welcome the Revolutions Per Movie, one of my filmmaking heroes, Jeff Fierzig. Hi, Jeff. Uh, thanks so much for having me. You know, having the video store, I was always pushing your work. The JT Leroy story, half Japanese, the band that would be king. The, of course, the devil and Daniel Johnson, which is an absolute classic. Is there a pressure to get to the story first? Like if you hear about JT Leroy and all the incredible things and that circulates and the mysteries in it, is there a period where you're like, I need to gain the trust. I got to get this going before somebody else tries to tell this story. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Like I, I, the only reason I do these things is how, you know, how I gravitate to these stories that I think are unique, untold, mysterious in some way important, moving, poignant. I don't always know the story when I start. Sometimes I just have a feeling there might be a really great story here, like in, you just brought up uh, author of the J.T. Leroy story. So that that kind of came about when I had a, this pal of mine, a uh, great music and film journalist, Paul Cullum. You know, he turned me on to it. I didn't really know that story as it, as it had unfolded. Um, I, I'd heard of J.T. Leroy, but barely. And um, right. all of a sudden, there was all this press. So, you know, there was a massive uh, Vanity Fair article. And then there was a really massive Salon.com article. Then there was a, you know, New York magazine. There was just a lot of ink generated on this story. Because it was, as far as the literary world goes, that was a big story. Oh, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, you know, and it was being labeled a literary hoax or perhaps the greatest literary hoax of all time at, at, at when it had hit. So I just read all these stories and um, they were all great. But there was one person who uh, whose voice was missing, one one perspective, and that was the, the author of the books, this woman who was um, exposed to have been the, uh, the teenage boy on the telephone, uh, Laura Albert. And I thought to myself, wow, I'd like to hear her story. Like, you know, she's the one who wrote these books. She's the one who created all this. And then I just did a huge deep dive. I just go in these rabbit holes. And that's kind of where I spend most of my life on these things. <laughs> and, um, you know, it turned out she had an incredible archive, very much like Daniel Johnston had. But, you know, I, of course, don't know. The, I don't know if people have this stuff when I initially meet them. So anyway, that was great to have. A, to have a fantastic story to explore get inside, peel the layers of the onion back and then and have the have the documentation, you know, whether it's photos, super eight millimeter, you know, self-documentation. Uh, uh, it could be journals, it could be uh, video, it could be all kinds of things. But the, all those things, those elements that, you know, that that's really fun for me to play with archive in hopefully unique ways. Yeah, it's amazing because how do you are you? self-editing as you're making the film how do you know what choices you're going to make and how you're going to build the story well yeah i mean I, I kind of am i mean i'm writing these things i mean these are you know these are non-fiction films um a lot of them are biographical so they happen in the past so there's a lot you can research and understand perhaps what the arc would be if you were gonna you know i, I like to make my films you know three act uh dramatic structure and that's just my way of somehow tricking the audience into just watching a film and not thinking like, oh, this is a documentary. This isn't a movie with actors and whatever. And um, 
I've been trying to blur that all along and make it just a really great immersive experience where you're not even thinking about it. If the story is well told and unfolding and it has humor and it's poignant and it's moving, you know, so that's just how I've been operating all these years and just trying to do that. And uh, that, yeah, that's a good example. I think you brought it up. Um, I'm really proud of that film. So do you ever find people like just flat out say like, I'm not interested or how, how, what's your process in terms of gaining people's trust to be like, I'm the person to tell your story? Well, you know, in the case of Laura Albert and JT Leroy, I, I found her in San Francisco through some friends. I sent her The Devil and Daniel Johnson. She watched it. She really, really loved it. You know, she's an artist, it's a film about an artist. You know, we spoke on the phone right after that. And, you know, a lot of people had gone after her story, her rights, you know, including like Harvey Weinstein. And, you know, a lot of people showed up with, um, you know, Hollywood money to give her, to tell her story. And she, she rejected all those people. She didn't know about me at the time. But when I showed up, she understood it's like, oh, okay, you know, you really are an independent filmmaker she said you know i'm going to work with you because of two two reasons she said a you're punk rock and you're jewish and i said well both of those are true and then we you know that was it i had gained her trust because of the work i had previously done and that was that and we went on a journey together i know very little about the legendary stardust cowboy no one knows it there's nothing to know there's nothing i mean you you and everybody else um that that's that's the point there yeah <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about who this is why you wanted to sure. make it and why it's animated of course yeah of course yeah well so so here's the deal we if you looked up the legendary stardust cowboy because we live in a unfortunately a wikipedia world where everybody just knows a little bit about a lot of things right i don't i actually don't i only know a lot about a couple things <laughs> i just <laughs> I just laser beam on a few things. Yeah. So anyway, I got lucky a long time ago. There was this, you know, out this record. This, you know, this is a, this is basically a film about one song. It's a song called Paralyzed. And there's life before Paralyzed, and life after hearing Paralyzed. I don't know how else to explain it. And everyone here is listening. Could you know, cue it up. I'll drop a little in right now. Here it is. Yeah. So that was parallel. Um, <laughs> Changed. <laughs> yeah. And it's been, you know, it's been called um, a novelty song, maybe perhaps the greatest novelty song of all time. I, I wouldn't argue that. But, uh, you know, when you hear that, you're saying, it's like, wow, who is this person? What? How did this happen? And there's a person behind that song. His name is Norman Carl Odom. And he's from Lubbock, Texas, where Buddy Holly was born. I'm a huge Buddy Holly fan. And this guy has the greatest untold story, as far as I'm concerned, that in the music world that anyone has ever heard. And then a lot of people years later came to understand that uh, David Bowie, who had a very open mind, he heard that song. He was label mates. Oh, okay. Uh, briefly with the Stardust Cowboy. His uh, nickname is The Ledge, which is a good nick, good nickname. Yeah. And um, he he had his mind blown so much by Paralyzed and uh, and as well as um, another forty five of the of the Ledge. I took a trip on a Gemini spaceship, which of course has space themes, and um, he took stardust from the cowboy and created arguably his greatest creation and character ziggy stardust wow um so bowie bowie had written um this masterpiece space oddity um and that was his first uh, big hit single but it actually didn't make him a star believe it or not and what was so cool about that first of all it's a great song but what happened was bowie 
had gone to see Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. And he um, he was tripping on a psychedelic soup. Um, <laughs> and if you can imagine how great that film is, but then add some psychedelic matter to the experience. And imagine being in London at the premiere. Psychedelic soup. Yeah. <laughs> then, and, then, and then get to the Stargate sequence. Sure. I mean, wow, right? And he walked out of that film changed. Uh, Kubrick, of course, was a little bit ahead of the moon landing. The, the moon landing was, you know, soon to come, but didn't happen yet. So everybody was, you know, there was, was a space race going on, right. right? And everybody was obsessed with getting to the moon in space. So Bowie tapped into that, wrote Space Oddity, great song, inspired by 2001. But back down in Lubbock, Texas, which is very close to Houston and NASA. Right. Uh, the cowboy, this little boy, every, every, you know, I don't want to make it a strictly male experience back in the, you know, 50s and late 50s and early 60s. But, you know, I don't know what it is. A lot of testosterone thinks about rockets, I guess. I don't know. But that's what happened. So this young boy, Norman Carl Olden, was staring up at the stars in flat Lubbock, Texas, and, and his imagination was incredible. Now, he also, he was undiagnosed back then, you know, he... He has Asperger's, the genius form of autism. So, you know, he has a different way of thinking and operating in this world. Anyway, so the space themes, he grabbed onto it and he, you know, came, came up with the legendary Stardust Cowboy and this persona. And that persona allowed him, it's like a superhero. It's like, it's like Clark Kent, Superman, like that. He could put that character on and not be shy around, you know, people and girls anymore and, have, and all of a sudden, be gregarious and have friends when he couldn't be just Norman. And that's kind of the story. Although what went on after, you know, he, he recorded paralyzed. I mean, the career is just one of the great stories, untold stories of all time. Oh, so anyway, I've been, so working on it. and uh, you know, it's, it's going to be mostly animated. Um, I like animation. I think it's a great medium. Um, and it's done in a Disney style, like old Disney. Wow. Uh, so Amazing. it's 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 an expensive film. It's a painstaking, laborious film because of if you look at like uh, Tinker Bell and you know old great classic Disney films, like there's emotion in the lines because it's hand drawn and you can see the movement. So that's the goal because Norman was inspired by Walt Disney, and he 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 wished he he wanted his story of his life told by Walt Disney. And, so that's his fantasy. So my job now is to make his dream come true and do it in Walt Disney style. I uh, can't which, wait, Jeff. Which is very, very, yeah, that's why it's taking so long. Oh. But, that, but that's, that's, that's how it goes. It's killer. Every, every subject you do, I'm just like, you can see into my mind. I think you can see into a lot of people in the culture just like waiting for something like this to, like a story like this to just, um, for them to obsess on and gravitate and learn more about. I love it that, it, you know, they're they're unlikely they're just unlikely people that you would expect to have stories you know told so beautifully about them but i just i'm i, I can't wait that's my geeking out i'm geeking out oh. but what's so funny the film that you picked charlie is my darling the rolling stones it's kind of a shorter film from 65 is very grounded there's no it's not outer space at all this is like very grounded. So why did you pick this film to discuss? Well, it's interesting. First of all, obviously, I, I really love the film and I'm excited to talk to you and this audience about this film. It's a very important film in documentary history. So, you know, that's a given. But the fact of the matter is, you know, everybody talks about the same films. It's just so boring. We've all heard. We all have seen the canon. We get it. Yeah. The films are great. Let's pick, let's talk about the films that people overlooked. You know, absolutely. This is an overlooked film times ten. That's what's so cool about Charlie is my darling. So uh, you know, I, we should probably set it up a little bit. Yeah, it was. I I heard that it was part of a screen test. Like they were kind of like wanting to capture the Stones at this time, and also I heard that the film was lost until recently. Like it didn't really, it got a really limited screening at the time, maybe like in 66, a couple of screens. And then just people even said it might've been stolen from Andrew Lugs Oldham's place. And there's all this stuff with Alan Klein, but 
I know I'm kind of getting ahead of the story, but it is it is kind of amazing. It was something I'd heard about, but had never seen until it was recently kind of reissued. Had you found a way to see it like in bootleg form or something like that earlier? No, I mean, I, this is just an accident. I just happened to see it because I love the early stones and I figured, yeah, let's just check this thing out. No one told me it was great. Yeah. And uh, so what happened was like, oh, listen, we've all seen Pennebaker's Don't Look Back, Dylan. Great film. I loved it. Always yes. loved it. And it's black and white. It's 16 millimeter. It's handheld. It's basically the birth of direct cinema, cinema verite. You know, I love that film. I love the Maisels. Uh, I know Albert, or I used to know Albert. I used to work with him a little bit. Oh, wow. You know, I love those films. And then all of a sudden, this, this unseen lost doc, uh, documentary about the Rolling Stones shot the same year as Dylan. Don't look back with the same black and white 16 millimeter handheld technology, the lightweight camera uh, appeared. And I just checked it out and I was like, oh my God, where did this come from? <laughs> so the, the irony is I, I showed, it's a great double bill. If you're going to have friends over or if you've got some cool micro cinema in your city or an art house, you know, that's a double bill and a half. You show Don't Look Back, Pennebaker, with Charlie is my darling. Maybe you show Charlie first because it, it is a little shorter, right? Do you feel like the Maisel's Beatles first U.S. visit kind of fits into that a bit? It doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, I love it. You know, it's on my favorite Maisel's film. My favorite Maisel's film is probably Salesman or Great Gardens. Yeah, me too. Um, but that just feels like they're just capturing. They don't, I don't, right. you know, which is fine. It's fine. Yes. How, I mean, it's great. I mean, the footage is incredible, but this, these two, when they're put together, because the editing is such a huge part of what makes a good verite doc back in that era, you know, perhaps great. That's what's going on here. So let's talk about that. So basically, first of all, we don't, first of all, we don't even know it exists. So that's the best yes. part, right? It's a mystery. <laughs> like it's an unknown film because no one's ever seen it. Right. So the stones are at their, earliest beginning peak it's it's 65 they're about to go to dublin ireland right and they're going to play a couple shows someone writes a check and they're going to like hey get a crew on this and film it no one knows what they're even doing they're just capturing right great but it is that peak moment when the stones go become like almost like actually become the real great stones the early great stones uh, with brian jones so you know, there's this director, his name is Peter Whitehead. I never heard of him, but he's, you know, he's in charge and he's doing a great job. And he might as well be Pennebaker or the Maisels. He's doing it, right? Yeah. But what's interesting with this kind of a subject, because you're basically a fly on the wall, it's all about what's in front of the camera. And if it ain't great, your film ain't great. And that's just how it is. So the Stones at this point, they're beyond great. I mean, it just doesn't get better. You turn the camera on and you're filming great. Yeah. So that's what's that's just the beginning. That's just the bones of this, right? Now, Alan Klein, you know, who ripped off the stones and whatever and owns all this footage and all that, you know, all that back and forth animosity over the years. You know, no one ever sees this thing. It's called Charlie is my darling, obviously named after Charlie Watts, the drummer. And that's it. And then 50 years later, 2012. Someone digs up not only the film, but all the raw footage. I think they found it in like a locker, you know, near Keith Richards house or whatever. And they, there's this director, Michael Goschenauer. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. He goes into an edit room with, for two years. Now, this stuff's not even in sync. Right. And he laboriously syncs it to, to you know, the, the really good, well-recorded sound. And anyone who sees this Blu-ray will have their uh, brains blown out because I've never heard anything as far as, a, as music and film from that era sound this incredible. I, I mean, it, literally, you'll, you, you, won't, you won't believe what you're hearing. You feel the music. Anyway, he puts it all together. There, there are interviews, but they're verite interviews. You're capturing the stones on a train. Yeah. They're doing little jams and writing songs on the piano with... Um, their great manager at the time, Andrew Lou Goldham. I mean, you're just like, whoa. I know. And it's also an era where you still remembered a manager's name, like a rock manager's name. 
you know, there was Colonel Tom Parker or Brian Epstein or, you know, and you know, all the way to Led Zeppelin. It's kind of a lost art nowadays. There was always this Svengali character. It was kind of fun to see Andrew in this holding court a bit and kind of being like as charismatic and kind of part of the action as they were. Yeah, we totally agree. I mean, there was always back then a wizard behind the curtain um, who was controlling not just um, you know, the band and booking their hotels, what they were really doing was controlling the image. Totally. You know, we know that Brian Epstein took the silver beetles and their leather jackets and dressed them differently and did the hair differently. Right. We all know that Lambert and Stamp, they weren't even managers, took the who, or I should say the high numbers, and filmed them. And we're making a movie kind of like this. And without Lambert and Stamp, these visionaries, there is no who. You know, same thing happened with the monks. Right. In Germany, there was a couple guys and guys who were on the Mercedes account and they loved music and they had this baked idea to take music and reduce it down to, you know, raw elements in there and dress the monks as monks and shave their heads. Incredible. There's always a whiz behind the curtain for the, for these, you know, sixties great bands, you know? And, uh, I love that. I love it the way you love it. And uh, Angela Goldham is that guy for the stones and he's an amazing character He's awesome. He's young and he's doing his thing. And he's out, he's in there. He's like, I think he's on piano or whatever. And yeah, Keith and they're writing a song. And you're just like, it, there's so many scenes that are identical to scenes that Pennebaker did with Dylan and, and his entourage. So that's why I'm saying you, you got to watch these two films together. It's interesting, though. I feel like one thing that is a little different is the Stones feel a little bit more comfortable with the camera. Like Brian Jones will stare right down the middle of the lens and just be like, the future as a Rolling Stone is very uncertain. My ultimate aim in life is not to be a pop star. Like, you know, they're just, they're so confident with their stature. And in a way, do you feel like Dylan and the other film, it feels like he's almost a little, I mean, he's cocky and he's confident, but a little embarrassed at times, it feels like. Well, that's that's part of the myth of that Dylan film. And that's what makes it great. And it captured exactly who that person was at that time, right. including provoking journalists and whatever. And I love that. It, 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 here's the punchline. I showed both films back to back to my son. You know, he he's in college, whatever, at Berkeley. He's a blank slate. He has no reason whatsoever to either like these films or not. We just watch the films. There is no doubt when you watch these two films back to back that Charlie is My Darling is absolutely the better film. Incredible piece of film. Um, and, and some of the things you just pointed out, I guess, help make it better, but it's not the reason it's better. It's like the personas that are captured, it's not better or worse. It's just that when you have an experience with two black and white films with almost the identical scenes, there's concert footage cut with some fans outside, cut with some interview, cut with some fly on the wall with managers. I mean, it's, I mean, it's almost, the, they're almost the same film. Yeah. But, you know, and Dylan's unbelievable. Don't get me wrong. I love Look back, but I'm going to go out on a limb and just say it right. That's why we're having this podcast, right? Charlie is my darling is the better film. You know, I'm not really a verite filmmaker, and that's fine. It's just one little flavor mm -hmm. I'll do a, a little bit of. But what what happened is it's a collision. It's always about technology. So this is a new medium, the 16 millimeter handheld uh, camera with sync sound that you could put on your shoulder and do handheld work with a zoom lens, that lens, that handheld feeling, that, that, that emulsion of black and white and lighting, like whatever it happened. Right. And you can't beat it. I saw recently there's a restored, um, Pennebaker of, um, Ziggy Stardust. Oh, I saw it in the theater like a couple months ago with the extra footage. I mean, oh my God. Right. Yeah, the transfer, yeah, you know, you can scan that stuff now at 4K. You, you never got, it just never got better. It's not just, well, obviously, once again, you're pointing the camera at something great. That never hurts. Sure. Ziggy Stardust, Spiders from Mars, the audience, it's like a paradigm shift of the culture. You got all these, you know, working class British lads dressing up as androgynous alien beings. I mean, there's a lot going on in front of that camera, right? But the lighting... The hand, it's the handheld 16 millimeter camera. There's something unbelievable about that. And it's never gotten better. So we see the aesthetics just sort of gradually fall apart as we're told technology improves and it never improves. 
like Super 8 is Super 8. It's a mat. It's just a great medium. 60 millimeter Bolex, great medium. This camera, 16 millimeter Sync Sam, incredible medium. And then, you know, we start getting digital in the 80s and this and happens. And it's just, it just, get every, it, the aesthetics just fall apart. And, um, you know, with my own work, I try to film handheld 16, like Devil and Daniel Johnson is super 16 handheld as well, Bolex. And, you know, people at that point were, you know, they weren't using the technology anymore. They're moving on to digital and whatever. And I rejected that. And I'm glad I did. Um, even JT Leroy has shot super 16 uh a lot of it a lot of it is amazing but now now the digital is getting better finally but there was a it was a dark period where digital just sucked um and i didn't like it and but back to you know getting get that handheld thing back in with old lenses things like that make a huge difference if you're pointing the camera at something worth pointing at that, that just my theory. What about the editing process? Did you did you ever edit on a, like a flatbed with grease pencils on any of your work? No, I absolutely cut on flatbeds. I learned with razor blades and tape and grease pencils. Like you said, I was cutting on uh, Steinbeck's. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not trying to mythologize that. It's just it forces your brain to think about each cut before make the cut because it's time consuming and it's a pain in the ass and you have to like slice a frame out put the frame back keep a trim and it just forces your brain to make hopefully good decisions to 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 create less pain for your work i, I worked at a media art center for five years uh, helping in education and had edited some people's work and you could feel what two frames felt like and it may have been just psychosomatic but when you're saving everything in envelopes and finding them and putting them back in and then being like okay now it feels right or trying to do a crossfade in your mind like just being like and the fade will go here and then it will feel like that and you're writing down numbers to give to a lab to do the process complete guesswork i feel like it really informed everything i did when the digital age came around because i just learned to story board better i knew what how to shoot at a better ratio like you know not waste people's time and kind of think about it is that similar in terms of its like influence in terms of how you you know shooting in 16 and uh waiting for labs to process and editing on a flatbed does it still inform your work even though you're shooting on video now yeah it really does um i'm glad you brought it up very few people talk about that um you know i learned before even cutting film i was cutting Real to real tape at, in college radio. I was the production director at, at WTSR Trenton in New, in New Jersey, so I learned how to cut tape with razor blades and make splices a long time ago. That was the first editing I think I ever did, and then I learned video editing and then film editing on flatbeds, and I was able to combine. There's no such thing as nonlinear digital editing right. at that point, of course. So this is all you could learn, and that's how I was trained. Um, but what's cool about uh, shooting film back in the day film is super expensive so like every roll of film in, in super 16 is only 11 minutes you get 11 minutes you don't want to roll out roll out suck right so if i was going to do for instance like a you know we did a lot of interviews for instance, on devil and daniel johnson so we would have to budget for that it's like okay well each roll of film plus processing costs a lot of money you know hundreds and hundreds of dollars so you go into an interview and you only turn the camera on when you better be rolling. Because if that thing's just rolling and rolling, that's just money going down the drain. So you'd say, oh, that guy, that person, that woman, that, you know, that's a three-roll interview. That's a four-roll interview. And you have to, and that's wow. all you get. Nowadays, you right. know, with, with um, digital, you could roll and roll and roll and roll. And, I, you know, we're all guilty of it. But the truth is, it's a bad idea. You want to turn that camera off. Right. <laughs> so... But then you guys sit in the edit room and, it, and it, you know, it's torture having to sit through too much. I, you know, I pride myself on filming as far as documentaries go as little as possible. A lot of people film and film and film, but then it kills you in the edit. I like to only film what I think we should film. I totally agree. It's also incredible. They are. I just forget. I, you know, I know they're young, but I forget they're 21 and 22. And just music obsessives. I mean, that's the one of the fun things about the film is it just shows how much they love 
music and the covers they're doing and just they're still kind of figuring out how to write original songs. Satisfaction is just kind of eking out at this point. Yeah, they just still seem like excited kids. That's a great point. Like that's I mean, the, the, the one song, which is the climax of the film, Charlie's My Darling, that I want to talk a lot about is the Bo Diddley song they cover, I'm All Right. Yeah. You know, I'm a massive Bo Diddley guy. Like, you can't imagine how much I love Bo Diddley. And all the 60s British bands covered Bo Diddley, including the Stones. Uh, they all covered different Bo Diddley songs because there was a lot of Bo Diddley songs to cover. And anyone who's listening now who does, hasn't really done the deep dive on Bo Diddley, just go because it doesn't get, doesn't get better. But yeah, the Stones were obsessed with the chess blues artists from Chicago, and Bo is on that roster. You know, they were obviously obsessed with Chuck Berry as well. But, you know, the truth is, like, there's a huge difference in Bo Diddley and Chuck Berry's styles. And um, I love them both, but boy, man, I'm a Bo Diddley man. It's like sometimes you got to pick Beatles versus Stones. Yeah. <laughs> and I pick, you know, if you, you got to pick basically Chuck Berry versus Bo Diddley. I pick Bo Diddley. Anyway, so let's talk about it. I'm all right. What's amazing about I'm all right is the Stones are even covering it because how the hell did they hear it? Because they, my research tells me that they might have toured with Bo Diddley and heard it live and then covered it. The only way to hear, even now, to hear a Bo Diddley recording of that song is on a super rare record that I love called Bo's Beach Party. Beyond hard to find. Oh, wow, that's amazing. I had no idea. I'm not even convinced that they heard it from Bo's Beach Party. Because I looked at on Discogs, right? Because this was always a mystery to me because I'm obsessed with this song. So uh, Bo Diddley's Beach Party says it came out in 63. Now, it was on Checkers. So maybe they did hear it on Bo's Beach Party. I have a friend who believes they, they toured together and heard it live. And we, we may never know. But anyway, how great is this song? This song appears on the Spaceman 3 album, Taking Drugs to Make Music to Take Drugs on the expanded version. And it doesn't get better. So the Stones do it um, on Charlie Is My Darling. Spaceman 3 do it, but it also appears on Sonic Boom's uh, California Lullaby EP. He does it again. I didn't know that. Uh, he, he calls it It's All Right. <laughs> I think Space Man 3 also call it It's All Right. But that's all right. But they do credit Bo Diddley. The weird thing about the Stones doing it is they're taking half credit. They're calling it, I believe, I'm All Right. Yes. And they're they're half crediting it, crediting it to Nanker Felge. Nanker yes, Felge right. doesn't exist. That's a pseudonym <laughs> for the Stones. Because there is no such thing as Nanker Felge, right? So anyway... That's the mystery. But let's talk about it in the film. What's amazing is the Stones are just kicking your ass song after song. Yeah. You're getting pain in my heart. You're getting uh, off the hook. You're getting time. It's on my side. I do want to say one thing before we get to I'm All Right, though. Yeah. Mick yeah. has one of the best stage moves, and I always have a soft spot for this. Yeah. When somebody comes out in the first song and they take off their coat already, like they're they're like, I'm hot. Why did I? And I love when somebody's like already overdressed and it's like a move to be like, oh, why am I wearing this whole thing? And he does this thing where he fake throws the coat out into the audience. But then he right. stops and he just puts it down over there. I just I have a soft spot for anyone shedding clothes on stage because it's like, you know, you're going to take this off. You know, you're going to get hot within like 30 seconds. But it's such a move. It's such a small move. But when I saw that, I was like, oh, Mick. I love you. And it just, they're just so, they're just on fire. Like you said, they're so focused and ready to destroy. Yeah, it's a good point. Like we should, we should remind the audience here that this is 65 stones. This is Morocco Mick. Yes. Now, Morocco <laughs> Mick, it, it, you know, is the best Mick. Let's be honest here. Right? You got I agree. Morocco, he's doing the greatest shuffle like subtle dance moves you could feel the rhythm in him he's not that later late 70s mick where you want to close your eyes and look at his whacked out dance moves that he still does like that's that's a different mick we're we're what we're, we're talking about here for any young people that don't know the difference 
we love Moroccan Mick. Now, what's cool about Moroccan Mick is that every teenager in the UK, in South America, in Mexico, all over the United States, they all went into garage bands to emulate Brian Jones and Moroccan Mick. That's what happened. That's where the garage rock explosion happened. And that's true. That, that, a lot of great music. So you get your back from the grave comps. You get your nuggets. You know, you get your pebbles, pebbles, you know, you know, you're getting all of that. And that's and a lot of great Texas site compilations. I mean, it's endless. That's a I deep know, it's well. incredible. And that's all from Morocco Mick. You know, I mean, they everybody wanted to be that guy, you know, and that's so cool. So you, you get to feel it here, you know. So anyway, so now you get to I'm all right in this film and and there's like a riot. I mean, the song's so powerful. Yeah. It creates a riot. You know, and then they have to like pull them off the stage. They're going to get killed. The fans are just like, they can't take it. The song is so powerful that they storm the stage. Like that's a powerful song. It's almost like when, when Brian Wilson recorded the fire song and it started the LA fires and he had to destroy the master tapes because he was like, didn't want right. to be responsible. That's how powerful I'm all right is. It's such a weird slow build too. Cause I don't know how you felt the first time watching it. People are on stage and they're kind of, you know, running around, but they're not, they're not destroying anything yet. Like they kind of run over by Charlie and stand behind him a bit and they're kind of dancing. And then it just starts taking a really dark turn where people start like wanting to grab Mick and hold on to him. And then all of a sudden Keith is in the line. And then Brian Jones gets the worst of it. Like people are like literally leaping on his back and trying to like drag him to the ground and they're fighting these people off. There's not there's not enough of the stones and their entourage to take care of this crowd in Ireland. And it is awe inspiring. You know, it, it's just it is what they captured and the way it escalates and the way they get the hell out of there. It's just you couldn't have asked for anything more spectacular visually or auditorily because they're they're breaking down musically like they're trying to keep going because they don't know where this is going to end. And then at some point it's like, we're just every, you know, things are just getting out of control. Yeah. And that, what is that? That is simply one thing, the power of Bo Diddley. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, it's so fun to watch. It's also like this concert thing in 65 and rock and roll. It's, it's all kind of new and no one knows how to behave or act. And, it's not some tired thing. You know, it's like, this is like, you know, riots did not break out. Although, you know, that's not true. I guess when the Beatles first started playing, there's a lot of great stories that um, the screaming teenage girls, when uh, after the uh, they left, you know, there were like rivers of urine in the theaters and the, and the, the people who ran the theaters had to clean it up. So like people were losing their bladders over the power of, of early Beatles. I thought that was fascinating when I read that. I, I love the early Stones. I mean, I really love, and I actually love um, early, early 70s Stones. I mean, so they had a whole different evolution. Sure. So like if you, you know, to me, like Exile is amazing, you know, but there's a lot of great records there. But what's so cool about Exile is if, if you listen to uh, the Link Ray album, uh, Three Track Shack, and check that album and you would be like, and it came out a year before the Stones. You're going to know that Mick and Keith were listening to Link Ray's three track shack because in a, in a garage or maybe a chicken shack in Maryland, Link Ray and his brother and one other person made this seventies exile sounding masterpiece. And it's just so obvious that they copped it. So, but I love that that period of stones later on, you know, it's a gray area. Like I just don't care anymore. And, and sure. but then again, it's like, there's great songs on some girls. There's great songs on tap. There's great songs right. even on emotional rescue. Um, it really is. Yeah. Agreed. But after that, I just can't go there. It's like a totally different band. It's like, you might as well be talking about, though, there's this great garage band, the stones. And then there's this band called the rolling stones. Yeah. Like, you know, here's the thing. Like if, if, if they would just do, you know, what we would call deep cuts, right? If they just did like deep cuts right. and they have them, boy, do they have them. Oh, believe me, I'd be the first one online. I would have the time of my life just to hear these old guys. And I don't begrudge them for getting old. We're all going to get old. 
just give give us a whole night of deep cuts because it's in your DNA. It's in their DNA. They, no one did it better, and 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 we and we'd all line up for it. Yeah, but they just feel the need. They got to play that stupid, horrible song. Start me up, and all you can have when you hear that is this image of like a Microsoft search engine or something. Like, <laughs> it, you don't want that. Well, the film also has a lot of fly on the wall stuff of them performing and getting drunk together and running to cars and escaping. Well, once again, I think it's the energy of what is actually captured. I mean, it's just like you're you're pointing a camera at a moment in time when artists, you know, I arguably are at their greatest moment. There it is. And it's captured. So like that alone, you just get right. to feel that. That's incredible. The editing, the parallel editing uh, between concert footage, uh, the the feeling of travel on trains, uh, the innocence of the fans outside in Dublin on the streets and the energy you're talking about when they're coming to a city and what that feels like that, you know, it's like Beatlemania, but it's Rolling Stones mania, right? Yeah. All that combined in, into, you know, well-edited, thoughtful piece with the technology of black and white handheld 16 millimeter and verite, you know, it just, it's a perfect storm that film. Yeah. And that's why we're here talking about it. And I hope people all check it out, you know, because I would guess most people haven't seen it. I'll put a link in the show notes. It's available online now. So. Oh, great. Great. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope people do check it out. It's a real and play it loud. You know, I mean, yeah, it's just, it's, Charlie is my darling. I have a kind of a goofy question to ask you, but I know that you're, a you know, a deep music fan like myself. Watching this film, is there one member of the Stones you would have liked to have been in this film if you could have shape shifted into their life? Hmm, let me think about that real quick. I mean, everybody, it's too easy to say Brian Jones because the, the myth of Brian Jones, Jones is that he, of course, uh, died young and left a beautiful corpse. Um, right. That is a beautiful thing. But the thing is, like, this, this was his band. The Rolling Stones in this period when it's Maraca Mick, it was it was Brian's band, and you could feel that on stage, totally. you know. And it's the teardrop guitar, um, and that's so cool, right? And then, of course, Mick and Keith take over, and they and they, and the band is still great. Some people would argue even better, um, but it's it's his band, you know. Yeah. Um, so to be someone, although I don't know if I ever wanted to be Brian, I never felt like that, you know, Charlie. Seems like a really sweet spot to be in this film. Yeah, it's, yeah, he gets the t he gets the title, and I love he's a class he's a class act. Let's be honest, he's a jazz drummer. I love jazz. You know, I listen to a lot of jazz, a lot of free jazz, a lot of you know all kinds of jazz. And Charlie is a jazz man at, at the end of the day, and a gentleman. You do feel that, right? Absolutely. Even at this point, and also just to kind of play as well as he did. And just kind of watch the rest of them, like do their thing, must have been a trip, you know, like to see the back of Keith Richards and the side, the profile of, you know, Bill Wyman. It just must have been like so wild to just be like, I'm holding it down and I'm the best musician in this band. <laughs> yeah. Well, he never overplayed. You know, he he, he knew how to play so cool. just behind the beat. You know, he was an artist. He was an artist. You know, he plays a small little jazz kit. You know, he wasn't Keith Moon. He He's Charlie. I mean, and, and, you know, he died recently, of course. Um, but, yeah, people should check this film out because it's, once again, largely an unknown film. Well, at the end of every episode, I ask the same question, but I tailor it to what uh, we're talking about. On a scale from one to ten, with one being the lowest and ten being the highest, how many locks of Brian Jones's hair do you give this film? One lock to 10 locks. Oh, I mean, Charlie is my darling is 100% a 10 lock of Brian yes. Jones. Beautiful blonde hair. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Absolutely. I had 12 here. I kind of beat the system. Jeff, this has been a total treat for me. So many of your films are coming up on the podcast where other people are talking about it. You've made some of the greatest documentaries you know outside of music as well and i can't wait to see the legendary stardust cowboy documentary i gotta tell you chris thank you so much it's really appreciated thanks for making my video store better too i appreciate it so 
indie video stores still rule. So They do. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Thanks, Chris. Peace, man. Thank you for listening to Revolutions Per Movie. We release new episodes every Thursday. We are a completely independently produced affair, so the best way to support us is to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app and to subscribe to our Patreon over at patreon.com slash revolutions per movie, where you can get exclusive weekly bonus episodes every Sunday, as well as one-of-a-kind handmade revolutions per movie goods that I send out to you. You can follow the show on social media at revolutions per movie and find more information about our various guests in the episode show notes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.